Uh, later on, uh, we'll put it on the website for others that couldn't join. Um, so uh, let me introduce uh, Jassy. Jassy is, uh, right, I'm saying it's correct, Senior Application Specialist in uh, CSC in Finland. And uh, uh, Jassy is going to give us some introduction to uh, GPOW application that we are uh, asking the teams and um, some about uh, what, what is the application and uh, a little bit about the competition itself. Okay, Jesse, go ahead. Okay, thank you. So <clears throat> can you change the slide, please? Yeah. So I will first give you a brief overview about the uh, GPOV software. Um, then discuss maybe a bit more about the parallelization that is that can be utilized with the code. And then finally, uh, the task that we have prepared for this, this competition, a uh, bit about the inputs we have there and then what is sort of expected there. So yes, so GPO, it's an open source software package uh, for doing um, quantum mechanical simulations uh, at the scale of atoms. So utilizing density functional theory, uh, that's a very common way to uh, study these kind of problems. And the uh, sort of typical length and time scale is uh, one studies with these kind of simulations, they asset the atomic scale. So they are typically uh, few atoms up to maybe a few thousand atoms at the largest cases and time scales they are typically also relatively short so uh, something from uh, uh, maybe femtoseconds to one one thousand times more something like that uh, sort of unique feature about cheap of is uh, that uh, uh, it can actually utilize, uh, you can use multiple basis sets. So uh, discuss that a bit more uh, later on. And one also a bit unique feature is that uh, it's implemented largely using a Python programming language. Um, development started in early 2000, I guess in 2003, in Technical University of Denmark. Um, and today there are uh, of course, it's an open source code, so it's uh, it's not so easy to always uh, know how many people are using. But based on the subscriptions to user mailing list and so on, one can and publications, one can estimate that there are a few hundred users. And in the in the GitLab, there are maybe something like uh, ten to twenty active developers at the moment. Okay, so a bit about my background. Uh, I did my PhD in, in physics in Helsinki University of Technology. Nowadays it's called Aalto University uh, here in Finland, Helsinki in 2003. And the thesis was, uh, was really about this kind of simulations, electronic structure of uh, magnetic materials. Uh, I've been working at, at CSC, which is the Finnish National Supercomputing Center, um, over 15 years now, and I've been involved in GPO development uh, since 2005. At some point, I've been a bit more active and some point a bit less active. Okay, so the problem uh, we want to solve, uh, we want to quantum mechanically uh, study the electrons uh, and uh, we had that chemical properties of, of atoms in systems. And uh, this can be described by the uh, mini-body Schrodinger equation. Uh, uh, problem with this uh, equation is that uh, it can be solved analytically uh, only for a single electron, so for hydrogen atom. And uh, when you start to study more complex systems, you need to resort to numerical methods and approximations. And what is even worse, the sort of uh, problem space uh, that's, uh, that grows exponentially with the number of electrons in the system. So it's, it's sort of clear that uh, direct solution of this equation is, is really not possible. If we would take 
something very simple like uh, uh, nitrogen atom with uh, 10 electrons and uh, describe in, in real space that with uh, only 10 grid points in each dimension we already would have a 10 to uh, 1000 to a power of 30 degrees of freedom which is of course something that cannot be cannot be dealt with classical computers quantum computers actually might be something that allows us to solve this much better so we need to do some approximations to solve this equation and density functional theory is one common way and the basic idea there is that instead of uh, uh, dealing with this uh, uh, three n dimensional wave function one actually maps that to a set of uh, uh, three n equations so basically instead of uh, uh, three n dimensional array there you have just three n arrays with uh, much smaller dimension next slide please uh, within the density functional theory uh, the equations we are solving are so-called consarm equations and uh, maybe the really important or only thing to really really note there is that uh, so for each electron in the system uh, we need to solve the sort of uh, first equation there but the uh, potentials we have there it is so-called hard free and exchange correlation potential they, they depend on the electron density and the electron density on its turn it's uh, uh, determined from these uh, wave functions side there so we have a sort of uh, uh, non-linear problem here we have a set of self-consistent equations so how this is solved in practice one makes the initial guess for the electron density uh, then solves for the psi uh, calculate new electron density uh, based on that you calculate these new vh vxe potentials and you go on and go and iterate that until uh, you have converged the solution and that's something you will also see in the uh, clearly in the output of the of the density functional theory simulation codes uh, this mapping uh, from many bodies running equations to these consign equations in uh, theory that's uh, exact it can be proven that there is uh, exact mapping only problem is that uh, the particular form of this mapping is is not known so this vxc part that, that we have there that's something that uh, always needs to be approximated and that sort of constitutes the physical approximation in these simulations uh, what can be done with density functional theory um, for example structure of matter what are the bond lengths in molecules uh, equilibrium crystal structures uh, formation energies of different uh, uh, structures catalysis in surfaces uh, we had in some of the previous lectures uh, we had lamps so how you can do molecular dynamics uh, using classical forces if you want to take into account also the quantum mechanical nature of atoms and electrons one can do up initial molecular dynamics uh, many properties of matter related to uh, the electronic structure can be studied with uh, with density functional theory and it's really one of the major consumers of uh, computational resources in all over the world in, in supercomputing centers Uh, when uh, solving these equations numerically uh, there are a couple of different uh, numerical approximations one needs to do the uh, particularly one that is used with uh, uh, with the cheapo is so-called uh, project or augmented wave method and uh, here the idea is that this uh, we want to make this uh, wave function psi a smoother so that it uh, it will be easier to discretize in our basis set uh, basic idea is that we can we can sort of uh, represent it as consisting of, of some smooth part 
which extends all over the space and then it's possible to make corrections but these corrections are then sort of local that they are only within some some radius from the from the atom and within this sort of radius they can be dealt more accurately and this adds uh, a sort of additional attempt there so uh, we have these uh, so-called projectors so so to be there and the uh, uh, bit particular notation means that it, it's sort of operator so uh, there are in practice there are some integrals with the bay function involved and that's uh, uh, when looking at the time spent in the calculation, uh, that also something that shows up in the uh, timing outputs. Next slide, please. Uh, as discussed, Chipov uh, uh, has uh, different options in how to represent uh, the wave functions numerically, how to discretize them. Uh, one possibility is to use uh, uh, uniform real space grids so the wave functions are just represented by the values in in real space uh, for the uh, derivative part there there is the laplacian uh, that can be dealt with the finite difference approximation there nice thing there is that there is a single parameter controlling the accuracy of the basis set so smaller you make the grid spacing age the more accurate the calculation becomes uh, this basis set has also quite good parallel scalability because there is only a local communication needed uh, other basis set that the uh, GPO can utilize and which is also very common in in the FT codes is a plane wave basis set once again, the nice thing is that there is a single parameter controlling the accuracy. A plane wave cutoff, how many plane waves you have there. Uh, that's typically given in units of uh, energy, electron volts, and larger uh, means that you have a more accurate calculation. Of course, always here when you make the calculation more accurate, also the computational burden increases. Uh, plane wave basis. Uh, that relies on uh, fast Fourier transforms for for many terms in the equations, and one limitation there is that uh, it uh, sort of uh, uh, implicitly requires always periodic boundary conditions. Uh, with the real space grids, it's uh, uh, it's possible to have uh, either periodic boundary conditions or boundary conditions where you have a finite system in any uh, any sort of different uh, dimensional directions, x, y, or z direction. Uh, with plane waves, the parallel scalability is also a bit limited by the need for the fast Fourier, Fourier transforms because they they sort of involve all-to-all -all communication. Uh, atomic orbital basis set is the third option, and the advantage there is that the number of basis functions one one uses that's typically much smaller and calculations can be made uh, in many cases faster however the accuracy is not uh, maybe that easy to control systematic way and in some cases uh, calculus are not necessarily as accurate as with the uh, with the other, other basis set at least it's it's sort of more difficult to make them accurate uh, all these different basis sets they have sort of their own pros and cons uh, uniform real space grid is typically good if you want to calculate large systems because of the good parallel scalability plane waves they can be very efficient in small to medium sized systems and um, if the, sometimes you don't need the sort of highest possible accuracy. And in these kind of cases, one can often make the calculation much faster with the atomic orbital basis set. Uh, for the tasks uh, in, in this competition, uh, it's mainly with the real space grid 
but for the coding challenge, we'll discuss that bit more detail. There is there is also option with the, or there is input using the plane waves. Next slide, please. Okay, as discussed in the beginning, Chipov um, is largely implemented in the Python programming language, and as you can see in the sort of uh, uh, actually already a bit outdated picture of uh, lines of code. Uh, really large majority of the, of the code itself is, is written in Python. So only the uh, computational intensive parts are implemented in C or utilize different libraries like uh, uh, plus FFTs, LAPAC, ScalaPAC. Uh, there are some, some quite, uh, I think, uh, good advantages of uh, uh, using Python. So it in many ways makes the development faster, uh, code can be made quite modular, and uh, it's uh, by using these existing kernels. So as one can see, the amount of C code has remained more or less constant for, for a long time. So many of the sort of new features can be implemented. Uh, in the Python itself. Of course, there is uh, some overhead from there. Python is definitely not as fast as, as C or Fortran, but in a typical production calculation, depending bit uh, on the size of system and so on, really majority of time is spent in the C Python libraries. So the Python overhead is typically something from uh, uh, 10 to 5%. Next slides, please. Okay, so let's discuss then a bit uh, uh, parallelization in GPOV. Uh, main parallelization scheme is by using using MPI, and MPI calls are made both from from C code and both from Python. So there are some communication that is is uh, uh, very directly coupled. To the, to the computational kernels, so they can be done in C. Uh, but there are also some cases where it's, it's more convenient to do them from Python. Uh, there is a relatively new option also to using uh, uh, threading with OpenMP uh, within, within a node. Uh, and by far, it's, uh, it seems that in some cases, it can improve the performance if there are really many, many cores per node. So for example, in uh, CSC's uh, uh, relatively recent uh, uh, Mahti supercomputer, we have uh, AMD uh, CPUs uh, with uh, 128 cores per node. And there in some cases, uh, one can get a bit better performance uh, when using OpenMP. That part is something that is not uh, really optimized yet, so uh, it's it's most likely lots lots of room for improvement. And at the moment, it can be used only uh, with the real space uh, and atomic orbital basis modes. It also requires uh, multi-threaded plus to get a good performance. So uh, Quite uh, quite large proportion of the computation is is actually done in the in the libraries, especially in the in the linear algebra. And in order to benefit from trading, one naturally needs to have a, a multi-threaded plus library. MPI calls at some some places they are made from uh, multiple threads, so the MPI implementation needs to have the uh, most extensive uh, thread safety level MPI thread multiple uh, with it. Uh, parallelization can be done over several degrees of freedom. So when when we are doing uh, uh, periodic systems, there is a sort of uh, additional degree of, of freedom uh, in the in the wave function equation, so-called k points. Uh, 
and uh, it's sort of uh, when studying periodic systems it's it's one more parameter controlling the accuracy how many k points you have uh, in magnetic systems the electrons they have an intrinsic property of spin which can have uh, uh, two values which makes that uh, basically one has two independent equations for each of these spin parameters and uh, both the k point and spin they introduce uh, nearly trivial parallelization so uh, in, the, in this uh, set of uh, self-consistent equations we had the first first part as the, as the sort of uh, 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 equation for the wave functions uh, they can be solved independently for all k points and spins and then only when calculating the density one needs to do summation or reduction over the k points and spin uh, in top of that uh, one can do domain decomposition so the brill space grids and the atomic orbitals they are also sort of uh, uh, represented in a in, in real space uh, so one can just uh, divide your grid to, to different process, uh, processes uh, there are also terms uh, coming from the uh, projectors in the projector grid wave method that will be distributed to the different uh, different processes and because of the nature of this communication is, is needed only uh, sort of uh, in, in grid points which are close to the domain boundaries so it's it's always just a local communication and uh, the, that, that's the reason why the scaling is typically good uh, when using a plane wave mode one can parallelize also over the plane wave coefficient but as discussed uh, that will require all to all communication Uh, there is also a possibility to parallelize over the electronic states so uh, sort of the, the parameters determine the system are how many uh, sort of atoms we have how many grid points we have and then we of course we have a certain amount of uh, electrons that, that that we are studying there and it's also possible to parallelize over these electronic states However, and that can be done both in uh, plane wave and in, in real space modes. However, that's much more communication intensive typically than the, than the other options. And uh, so it's uh, typically one involves that only at the point when the domain decomposition or the parallelism of plane waves no longer scales depends lots on the actual hardware also a bit on the input data and so on but typically typically it's not uh, useful until using several hundreds of, of cpu cores uh, sort of final parallelization possibility is that uh, uh, especially with the uh, uh, with the real space or then with the plane wave code uh, there is uh, generally some iterative uh, diagonalization methods used for sort of uh, sparse matrix type type operations but there are also some dense matrix diagonalizations and uh, in small to medium scale system these uh, dense matrix diagonalizations they really don't consume much time but as as the contribution uh, or computational complexity is, is sort of number of electrons to uh, power of three uh, with larger systems they start to or might start to become bottleneck and in these cases it, it's possible to utilize, utilize scale back for for these operations uh, typically for real space and plane wave basis it is beneficial 
uh, when there are over 100, uh, 1000 electron states in the system. Uh, the atomic orbital basis, it actually uses more of these dense matrix diagonalization and the, there it can be beneficial already with the, the smaller number of electrons. Okay, thanks. Next slide. Uh, just a few words about uh, installing GPOV. Uh, I think there are quite good instructions uh, in, the, in the wiki of the competition and also in the, the GPOV home, homepage. Um, generally, uh, if you have ever uh, installed uh, Python software with, uh, with the pip from the Python package index. In principle, GPOV can also be directly installed from there if uh, all the non-Python requirements are met. So when you're installing that way, uh, the, some of the dependencies, they are sort of result, but only, only for the Python packages. Uh, for this competition, uh, we would like to use you uh, one specific version, so the latest stable version 21.1, though, and uh, install that from the source code by cloning the Git repo. Uh, when installing that, uh, there are typically uh, some configuration one wants to do. At the minimum, it's uh, it's typically at least the last library that uh, one wants to specify. Uh, there is the environment variable, uh, cheap of config, which one typically points into a file called uh, siteconfig.py, and in this siteconfig.py, one can uh, designate that uh, different options for the installation. So this piece here just shows that uh, uh, if you would like to link against OpenPlus, uh, there would be for the libraries variable, you would put the name of the library there, and one can also add the uh, library directory there, and out of these, the sort of uh, normal uh, link lines, minus capital L path and minus L library name will be will be constructed when building GPO. Next slide, please. Uh, by default, uh, when you build a chip of uh, MPICC is used for the compilation and the compiler options by default are those that uh, were used for the Python interpreter itself. Uh, however, it's possible to uh, set uh, yeah, other compiler in this side config.py and also additional optimization flags, et, et cetera, there. And you can find more details uh, in the in the competition wiki or in, in GPOV uh, page, how to set up this and maybe some settings for some particular machines. Uh, once you have installed code, uh, then you typically need to set the uh, path and Python path or Python user base environment variables. Final thing is to download uh, the, the PAW, so datasets related to the project or augmented wave approximation. Uh, and there is a sort of uh, simple command, chip of install data, and then you can give some directory where you want to have this installed and that will then automatically download them from the uh, uh, web and put under this, this directory. And it will also set some sort of uh, hidden configuration files so that this, uh, this data will be automatically found later on. And after these data sets uh, have, been, uh, have been installed, one can perform very simple serial test calculation just by uh, issuing cheap of test. Uh, or if you want to do that in parallel, you could use or do uh, MPI exec minus N for cheap of test to run that with uh, uh, four MPI tasks. Uh, 
there is also quite extensive test set uh, that can be used when when developing code to see that uh, you haven't uh, broken anything when when modifying the code okay next slide please uh, also a unique uh, feature of Gpo is that the input files they actually python scripts and uh, that can be sometimes uh, convenient uh, in many cases uh, when you're doing these kind of simulations there are some workflows and uh, many many codes they have some the uh, input file format of their own and one quite often ends up by writing shell scripts which modify these inputs here as the input files are scripts uh, uh, themselves, one can actually have a relatively complex workflows programmed in the input file itself. Uh, before doing the actual calculation, uh, one can, oh, it's sometimes useful to check that the input file is syntactically correct and also find out that. Uh, uh, how much memory usage is estimated for these parameters and what kind of parallelization settings would be used with in processes by doing a dry run. So by using this uh, uh, dash dash dry run option, uh, the program does only some uh, inexpensive initialization and then prints output to the sort of output file defined in the in the input, which one can investigate and see that uh, whether the parameters look sensible. Uh, for the actual uh, calculations, uh, that depends on uh, what system one, one is using or MPI installation. So uh, typical way, for example, to, to launch uh, with uh, 40 MPI tasks would be with uh, just MPI exec uh, minus N40 and then Gpov, Python, and then the name of the input file. Uh, here is a very simple example of uh, uh, Gpov input. So let's say they are Python scripts and they typically start by uh, importing some, some useful modules. So Gpov relies heavily on uh, atomic simulation environment, which is a set of uh, Python tools for doing uh, uh, inexpensive manipulations for these atomic systems. So one can use them for uh, setting up crystal structures, molecular structures, uh, many kind of things. And sort of nice feature with this, uh, this uh, atomic simulation environment is that uh, uh, you can actually use that with many other codes than Gpov. So it, it sort of has this notion of, of calculator. So calculator is something that can do expensive calculations. And uh, time being, there are probably 10 to 15 different calculators that the AC supports. So sometimes if one wants to try uh, different DFT code with the same atomic system. Uh, you need to change only a few lines in the, in the input. So in this particular input, that's, that's just for basic uh, uh, cubic uh, crystal and silicon. So we construct the atoms object with the bulk function. And after that, we set the chip of calculator uh, with some parameters, the grid spacing of uh, 0 0.2 angstroms, this is a periodic system, so we provide some set of K points there. Um, approximation for the, for the exchange correlation. And then you can also provide the, the uh, file where the sort of uh, log type text output will be put. Actually, there is a typo there. So one should either have the uh, out file variable defined somewhere or then have this out file here as, as a string. Uh, once one, one has uh, defined the calculator, 
that needs to be attached to the, these atoms and then one can uh, launch the calculation from these uh, atoms get potential energy and uh, sometimes for example if you want to print something out uh, in the uh, input one might want to also have information about parallelization so there is the sort of uh, MPA world uh, object we we have also access there and some things can be done only in this case for example printing out the energy only for the prank zero next slide please uh, the output contains uh, quite a bit of information so in the beginning of output one always has uh, what what is the particular version uh, of the chip of used if you're using development version you can see you see the git hash there uh, it will show some information about the libraries used version of the libraries etc and i guess for for this competition the interesting information is the printout of uh, the total number of cores used uh, if using OpenMP trading, that will be also printed out there. And then there is some printout also about the parallelization scheme used by the default. So here we can see, for example, that there would be parallelization over uh, K points with uh, four MPI tasks. And then in top of uh, domain decomposition with uh, two by two by one. So if you multiply these together, you, you get the 16. And then you will see the output about the self-consistent iterations. So as discussed, we are making a, first some guess for the density, solving for the wave functions, calculating new density, and so on and so on. And you can see the uh, output here. Uh, yeah. And at the end, there is various timing information of different components, and here, there is, of course, the total timing, uh, but as uh, as the maximum number of uh, iterations we carry, it's uh, it's for these benchmarks. It's it's a bit limited. Uh, one is probably more interested about the time spent in the actual SCF cycle here. Next slide, please. Okay, so we are coming now to the uh, tasks we have in this in this competition so in the first one the task is just to uh, try to build uh, and install a chip of uh, in uh, both the Singapore cluster and Niagara in Canada and then try to uh, investigate and discuss the scalability of the calculation in these two two machines the input case we have here is a, a file with uh, called uh, copper.py and that's basically a copper filament uh, which is uh, periodic in the, in the z-dimension. Uh, there is a real space basis used there and then th there are also a couple of k points in, in the z-dimension. And uh, there is, uh, if you look the input, there is the uh, max iter keyword there uh, that just limits the maximum number of iterations done to uh, 15 in this particular case. Uh, for these tasks, uh, you are not supposed to make any, any modifications to the input, just uh, try to run the, uh, run the calculation. Okay, for next next task, uh, you are supposed to make uh, a nice a nice visualization about uh, ele electron localization function. So it sort of uh, can be used as uh, as a measure of, uh, for example, how the uh, electronic bonds and and so on in in molecules or in uh, crystals look like. So for example, the picture you see here, that's for the benzene molecule. And one can sort of see that uh, there is a, a 
particular isosurface there plotted and and one can see that there are some electrons localized between the uh, carbon atoms there there are also some electrons uh, around the hydrogen atoms and and so on uh, your task here is that the uh, input it's a uh, uh, graphene uh, nano ribbon uh, with the uh, uh, cold uh, atom attribute on top of that so there is input which uh, calculates uh, does the self consistent iterations calculates electronic structure and then uh, writes this electron localization function into a dot cube file and your task is uh, try to make a, a good looking uh, visual picture out of that uh, there are some hints uh, for software that can be used, for example, in Cheapo Wiki. So VMD is one possible software. There, there are also some some other options, and uh, I think you can just use your imagination. Uh, it's possible to make uh, animations of that, or you can just make some nice-looking uh, uh, surface slices of the, uh, or just look the actual actualize the surfaces so use your imagination uh, the following task is is profiling a calculation so uh, in this case we'll be using again the same copper.py input case and your task is use the uh, IPM profiler and get the get put picture and, and a report out of how, how the profile looks like. Uh, that's not really task here, but just in case you are uh, interested, uh, there is also additional input file, uh, copperprofile.py, uh, which uses a profiler from Python standard uh, library, uh, profiling the code and uh, it can be useful in some some cases. Uh, problem naturally there is that it, it's not really MPI aware, so it will be writing a separate file for each MPI task. But it, it can be interesting maybe for some of you. Okay, and then we have the task about uh, uh, performance tuning. Uh, so your task is uh, try to get this uh, copy.py while calculation run as fast as as possible and things you can do there is uh, pretty much anything which doesn't alter the end results so you can try uh, different compilers uh, intel compiler GNU compiler different compiler different options uh, different libraries and here you are also allowed to do any modifications to the source code uh, as long as the sort of uh, I mean at the end of the input there is check for the accuracy of results uh, as long as that that passes uh, you are also allowed to use uh, uh, any non-default parallelization and options uh, in order to do that you can also alter the input so there is the possibility there is a uh, parallel keyboard for the for the calculator that one can use the example here for using band parallelization i'm not sure whether it really affects performance in positive way but uh, tuning these these parameters that's that's also allowed and uh, you can try also the open mp trading and uh, optimize the code the, the c code in in any way you find suitable for improving the performance. Uh, there is also sort of a small bonus task here. So there is a, a small bug in Jeep of Scalabug functionality. Uh, documented in this ticket uh, seems to happen only with uh, some particular uh, input in, in special cases. Uh, uh, and doesn't be that drastic, but still it would be nice to get fixed. So if you are able to fix that, uh, 
something that the whole chip of community will will thank you and just to note that okay for the other tasks uh, for performance tuning you might want to try scale back uh, see whether it improves performance or not but here uh, it's uh, absolutely needed because i mean it's a bug in the scale back functionality for the visualization and for the billing and running it's not needed okay and then the final thing is that uh, 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 in coding challenge uh, you should analyze uh, MPI all to all P patterns and Chipo is the uh, one code that you're supposed to use there. And for that task, uh, there is the input file uh, uh, SI D vacancy. So that's a D vacancy in silicon. And as already discussed, uh, the plain wave basis is much more heavier with all to all communication. So that input uses the plain web basis. Okay, that's uh, everything what uh, what I had now. Um, do you have any questions at this point? Thank you, Jesse. It was very, very good presentation. Anyone feel free to ask question to write or to write in the chat. Of course, if any questions arise later on, feel free to use the Slack to ask. Okay. So it looks like uh, everyone uh, understand everything. Um, uh, there's one uh, notifi one feedback from my side. In the beginning, when I tried the GPAO with, uh, I think slightly older OS, maybe uh, CentOS Seven or something. He was complaining about C11 uh, missing in the compiler or something like that. That uh, GNU compiler dependencies or some or around that. When I tested that on uh, Inbox uh, CentOS 8, it didn't the I didn't have any uh, of those dependency with the Inbox uh, GNU compiler. This is uh, my only feedback uh, that I uh, when I tested that a uh, while a while ago. Okay. Anyway, uh, I would like to thank uh, Jassy and everyone uh, joining. Uh, again, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to contact us on Slack, email, whatever easy. Uh, we'll try to support. Um, as for the access for the NSCC class, I'm checking that with their IT. I know that some teams didn't uh, get their access there. And uh, I know that most teams already have their access to the Niagara cluster. So you can start over there. And uh, our next uh, meeting would be the opening ceremony in about three weeks, if I recall and uh, may 24th uh, i will uh, send some announcement around that we'll uh, do some uh, introduction and uh, formal opening so again thank you uh, jesse for a good presentation and thank you all for uh, uh, staying with that listening okay i will upload the slides and the uh, and the uh, recordings to the website so uh, people can refer to that later on. Okay, so thank you all and uh, okay. Thanks. See you later. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye.